Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 94. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. On today's episode, I'm so pleased and proud to have James Turk. James is the co-author of The Money Bubble, and the coming collapse of the dollar. In this interview, James and I talk about how government debt got so out of control, why what's happening in Greece will eventually happen in the US and many other countries around the world, why what happened in 2008 will happen again, what real wealth is and what financial wealth is and what's the difference how goldmoney.com was devised in 1979 before the technology even existed to make it happen, what future forms of currency and commerce are likely to be, and how currency evolves over time and the next global online commerce. James, welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm very, very excited and pleased to talk with you today and bring your information out to all of our listeners. You're co-author of the Money Bubble book, which I have right here, What to Do Before It Pops. You and James John Rubino were co-authors on that, as well as The Coming Collapse of the Dollar, which I also read. So those are two subjects that are near and dear to my heart, and we want to cover what's going on with government debt and gold and a whole lot of things today. But before we do that, could you please explain your background and how you became so knowledgeable in this area? Yeah, um... Uh, 68 years old, so I've been around quite a bit. Um, I've lived in seven different countries. I've traveled to over 50. Um, I've focused on international banking and finance uh, and money management throughout my career. Uh, Initially, I began my career with the Chase Manhattan Bank and spent most of um, my time with the bank uh, in the 1970s living and working in Asia. Um, I left uh, the bank in 1980 to pursue investment management. Um, in the mid-1980s, for several years, I was working with the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, which is that country's sovereign wealth fund. Uh, and then after resigning from them in the late 1980s, I've been basically independent. Um, in the late 1990s, working on what had been for me throughout my adult life a pet project, uh, called Gold Money, which actually turned into a fairly successful business operation. Launched that in February 2001. Which is exactly how I became acquainted with you, and I, I definitely want to talk about that in just a minute. But let's start with really where the whole issue begins. And in the money bubble, you talk about the government <laughs> debt sort of being where you know we're having this this bubble that's growing. Tell us about what's going on with the government debt and why that's such a problem. There have been too many promises made by politicians. What they've been doing is borrowing and spending money, borrowing and spending money. And while the government's finances are, are, are big, it relies on the same principles that we as individuals have. Um, you have to spend what you earn. Uh, if you borrow money on your credit card and then spend that uh, you're ultimately going to get yourself in trouble by having too much debt. And that's exactly where the U.S. government is at the moment. And this process has been facilitated over the past several decades, going back to 1971, uh, when President Nixon temporarily suspended, and that's a quote, temporarily suspended the dollar's formal link to gold. Um, when that happened, the discipline on the money creation process was removed. It used to be that you could only create money if you had gold in reserve, Um, but now they can create money, as the saying goes, out of thin air. Um, Take a piece of paper, slap some ink on it, and and call it money. Uh, And as a consequence, that process of money creation and the borrowing and spending by uh, uh, politicians has created the, um, the, the, the problem that we face today. And the tragic thing about this, uh, Linda, is that 
you know, the country's gone through this kind of a crisis before. After the War of Independence um, in the uh, 1700s, uh, the first currency of the country was called the Continental. The government had spent too much money. The Continental was not backed by anything of substance, not by gold, not by silver. The currency collapsed. It created chaos. And the framers created the Constitution in order to establish a sound monetary system. Gold and silver are the constitutional money of this country. And so it was up until 1971, uh, more or less. Um, and we've jettisoned, uh, we've thrown out the wisdom of the framers. So as a consequence, we are relearning the same problems that the framers faced when the Continental was teetering on the edge of collapse. So it's history repeating itself again. Yep, absolutely. Um, you know, sometimes things change, the circumstances change, but you know, if we ignore history, as the, as the philosophers say, we're doomed to relive it. And here we are again, ignoring history, and we're facing the same problems that not only this country has faced before, but many countries have faced when they remove the discipline from the monetary process. The thing is, is that oil and government, uh, excuse me, money and governments are like oil and water. They, they don't mix. You have to be able to put control on politicians, um, their, their, their um, you know, eagerness to make promises, their eagerness to spend money. The only way you can effectively control that is by having a link to gold and or silver. And we abandoned that link, as I said, temporarily in 1971. We've not gone back to it. But ultimately, we're going to go back to gold and or, and or silver in some combination uh, at some future date. The government will either do it willingly, uh, or it will be a question of um, being forced to do it uh, because of problems with the dollar. And so that link to gold really keeps the government from getting out of control with their money creation. Yes, that's exactly right. It's a discipline imposed on governments. You can only create the currency uh, that circulates in place of gold um, by linking it back to gold. The, just looking at this a little bit, um, we need to distinguish between money on one hand and currency on the other. You know, money comes into existence the same way that all goods and services come into existence. Um, we, we need capital, we need labor, um, and we spend that capital and labor to build a mine, um, and that mine comes up with gold and or silver production. Um, that process is, has worked throughout human history. You know, gold's been money for 5,000 years. Silver's been money for 5,000 years. But what we're using today in national currencies, and this is the key theme of the book, John, and I wrote the, the Money Bubble. What we're using today, we call it money, but it's really a money substitute circulating in place of money. And if you go back in monetary history, Every time you have a monetary substitute, a piece of paper or some government promise circulating in place of the real thing, you know, physical gold or physical silver, you ultimately have a collapse of those money substitutes, a collapse of a currency, it's, you know, a currency collapse. And we've had a hundred currency collapses around the world since the end of the Second World War. And they've all resulted because of too many promises by government politicians that cannot be possibly fulfilled. Because when you make a promise, you, you need the income, you need the wealth in order to uh, spend the money to fulfill that particular promise. And what we've seen is just the, uh, far too much um, uh, spending by governments relative to the amount of wealth being created uh, and collected uh, by taxes. And you bring up a good point because there have been other money collapses, currency collapses, and now we have so many sovereign wealth government situations around the world with Portugal, Ireland, you know, Greece, Spain, you know, the pig countries. Is what we're seeing in Greece a foreshadowing of what we're going to be seeing here? Yes, exactly. It's the writing on the wall. It's not just Greece. You know, it was Iceland before that, uh, Hungary before that, you know, U Ukraine, uh, Ukraine at, at present, Argentina at present, you know, Venezuela, um, uh, 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 it's also another currency that's in the process of collapse. You know, this is writing on the wall, and they all have the same symptoms. Uh, it's, you know, government, government's creating too much money. 
um, and ultimately destroying the currency. Yeah, absolutely. And it's shocking to see it all happening at once and all this incredible money printing because really didn't everything sort of take uh, an accelerated direction in the 2008 crisis when when TARP happened and then quantitative easing and all that money printing in effect happened and then it began to happen worldwide. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you know, what we've been building um, in terms of the economy, um, we, we've been doing it on a shaky foundation. Uh, you need sound money in order to build a good economy. Uh, you know, a good economy is based on savings. A good economy is based on production. It's not based on debt. Uh, it's not based on government bailing out people who have made bad decisions. But that's exactly what we saw in 2008. So we have this rickety structure that we call uh, a monetary system uh, trying to hold up an, a, an economy that's not sustainable because we don't have good money. Um, and we saw it in, in, in very clearly in 2008. They managed to patch it together and keep that rickety structure um, up a little bit longer. But since then, the amount of debt in the world has doubled. Um, the problems haven't uh, been solved. Uh, as the proverbial saying goes, they kicked the can down the road to let some other politicians to, you know, to deal with it. But what we saw in 2008 is going to come back yet again. The issue is, is that you can't, pre you can't predict when that's going to happen. Uh, all you can do is prepare for it so that when you are prepared, you can sleep well at night knowing that you and your family uh, are, are ready for another type of 2008 event, or, you know, or, or even worse, if that should be the case. Mm -hmm. And now we have Janet Yellen talking about raising interest rates. I understand about 70% of our total debt right now is actually interest. And how is right? How are we going to survive with rising interest rates in this environment with this increasing debt? And now, of course, it's just going to snowball faster and compound faster with rising rates. Isn't that going to be quickening this problem that we're talking about? Yeah, but they're not going to raise rates. You know, I've been saying this for a couple of years, and the reason why they're not going to raise rates is they cannot afford to pay a fair rate of interest. Let's just look at the mathematics a little bit on this. The U.S. government presently has about $18 trillion of debt. Let's say they raise the interest rate 1%. That means there's an additional $180 billion of annual interest expense paid on that debt because of the 1% rise in rates. Now, let's assume the U.S. government goes back to a fair rate of interest, like 5 or 6%. We're talking about a trillion dollars of additional interest expense uh, that the U.S. government would have to pay. And the U.S. government only takes in about $3 trillion a year of revenue. So are they going to cut back spending on defense or welfare or politicians' salaries in order to pay interest in, instead on this $3 billion of revenue that they're receiving? They're never going to cut back. What they're going to do is just borrow more money. And by borrowing more money, that means they're going to have even a bigger interest expense bill. And that's how you ultimately hyperinflate and collapse the currency. That's what happened to the Continental. That's what happened to a variety of different currencies around the, the world's the Second World War. Uh, it's happening now in Argentina and Venezuela, uh, happening in Greece, except in Greece it's a little bit different because they, they can't create the currency because the currency is under the control of the European Central Bank. So the economy as a consequence is, is, is suffering as a, as a result. So the point is, is that they can't really raise interest rates. You know, maybe the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates at the end of the year by a quarter of a percent to try to maintain credibility. But they've already lost their credibility because if we think about it, after the financial crisis and they did all of these bailouts of banks and um, investment banks that made bad decisions uh, and used taxpayer money to, to save the shareholders of all of these companies, Bernanke was saying that when the interest rates, um, uh, when the unemployment rate fell below 6.5%, uh, interest rates would start rising. Well, we went below that 6.5% threshold a long time ago, uh, and interest rates still are near zero. Earlier this year, they were saying they're going to raise interest rates in, in June, at the uh, Fed meeting in June. They didn't do it. Now they're saying they might raise it in February or at the end of the year. I mean, they're going to keep talking about it, but the reality is they can't raise interest rates because the U.S. government cannot afford to pay a fair rate of interest. And this is true not only for the U.S. government, it's also true for other governments around the world. Hmm. Well, that puts them in a tough position. 
Yeah, it really does. But it ultimately comes back to the reality that they cannot fulfill all of the promises that they made. So we as individuals have to, you know, say to ourselves, okay, well, some of these promises are going to be broken, um, and I don't want to be reliant on any promises of others. So what we have to do is we have to prepare for an uncertain future by making sure that if these promises are broken, you're, you, you, the impact on you and your family are going to be minimal. Mm. Yeah, so a way to for people to have the smallest impact on their family is by protecting themselves with some real stores of value like gold and silver. Is that right? Yeah, it's exactly right. The way to look at it is that Wealth comes in two different types of forms. Uh, you've got tangible assets, you know, things like real estate, houses, uh, gold and silver, oil wells, uh, timberland, uh, office buildings. That's a form of real wealth. The other kind of wealth we have is financial wealth. Uh, financial wealth like T-bonds and T-bills and uh, insurance policies and bank deposits. But all of these financial assets come with counterparty risk. In other words, the value of that asset, the value of that financial asset is dependent upon the financial capacity and the willingness of the counterparty to make good on their promise when you ask for them to make good, <laughs> make good on it. In other words, you know, the poor people in Greece, uh, they thought that their bank promises were good and when they went to the bank and found the banks closed, you know, the promise wasn't worth anything. They couldn't even get into their safe deposit boxes to get their gold or silver coins, which is why I never recommend storing anything in a in a bank uh, uh, safe deposit box. But going back to the, the point, you have these two types of wealth. You have real wealth and you have financial wealth. And what you want to do when you're in an economic difficult period, and you know we have this boom and bust cycle. Uh, you know the good times are the boom, the bad times are the bust. And we've been in the bust since 2000. Uh, um, which we can get into in more detail if you'd like. But this bus is going to continue until we eventually reconcile how all of these debts that are outstanding are going to be uh, dealt with. They'll either be repaid by the borrower or they're going to be written off by the lender. One way or the other, the, debt, the level of debt has to come back down to a more normal level. So while you're in this bus cycle, you want to uh, tend to avoid financial assets and focus on owning real assets. Now, there's a special type of asset called a stock in a, in a company. And, you know, the question is, is it a financial asset or is it a real asset? Well, it's sort of like a near tangible asset in the sense that if you own shares in Exxon, you're basically owning um, uh, real assets, you know, the oil wells and tankers and everything else that that company owns. But if you own shares in a bank, uh, those stocks, that stock is really closer to a financial asset rather than to a, 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 um, a, a real asset. So when it comes to stocks, you have to be sort of careful in terms of picking and choosing um, which are the uh, equities of companies that are dealing in real assets, you know, mining companies, agricultural companies, commodity companies, and things of that nature versus financial companies, banks, mortgage companies, insurance companies, which would be a financial asset, not a real asset. Mm-hmm. Don't you think it's somewhat surprising that we've seen this pullback in the price of gold and silver? No, it's, it's a result of gold and silver being, um, uh, the gold and silver markets being impacted by intervention by various governments around the world. Um, you know, gold, for all practical purposes, for the past hundred years, has never really been a, a free market. You know, ever since um, Britain went off the classical gold standard in 1914. Um, it, it's been one in which uh, central banks uh, have you know, maintained control, but it, it, it's changed over the years. It, the classical gold standard was invented by Sir Isaac Newton in around 1700. And in terms of purchasing power, a British pound in 1914 had essentially the same purchasing power as it did in 1700. Uh, so, in other words, you could buy the same amount of commodities and, and um, food, for example, in 1914 as you could in 1700 with, with, a, a, uh, with a British pound. But what central banks were doing then is they were managing the currency that they issued 
in order to maintain the purchasing power of of gold. Uh, so the British pound, which was the money substitute for, uh, uh, at that time, a quarter of an ounce of gold, um, the Bank of England was always making sure that they would never issue too much of the currency uh, so that the currency never went to a discount to the purchasing power of gold. What's happened in the last century, which is a century of increasing government control, increasing government um, uh, centralizing, taking over uh, economic activity, uh, taking over the lives of individuals, um, uh, eroding individual liberty and individual freedoms. Uh, central banks and governments have taken a different perspective on how the relationship is between gold and currency. What they've been doing is they've been intervening in the gold market to keep the gold price subdued to make the currencies they issue look better. And this goes back quite some time. Uh, just going back to the 1960s as a clear example, the U.S. government disordered 10,000 tons of gold in the 1960s um, in order to maintain the fiction that the dollar was, uh, was worth 35, one ounce of gold was worth $35 when everybody realized that one ounce of gold was worth more than $35. But rather than recognize that reality, the U.S. government was intervening in the market and taking all of the gold out of Fort Knox and selling it at $35 an ounce until eventually uh, the interventions collapsed in March of 1968 with the breakup of the London Gold Pool, which was a central bank cartel, and the gold price then rose for another 12 years. Now, we're seeing the same thing today, but the intervention is hidden to a certain extent. You know, back then we could clearly see the gold coming out of various central banks, and to a certain extent we can see that today, but not with the same transparency we could back in the 1960s. But essentially it's the same thing. Um, gold is moving from Western central banks to Eastern central banks uh, and Eastern individuals. In other words, the Chinese um, central bank has been a huge accumulator of physical gold. Chinese individuals have been a huge accumulator of physical gold. Uh, the Indian uh, market has always been an important um, place where physical gold is acquired and accumulated. So we're seeing a massive flow of metal from Western central banks to the east. And what the Western central banks are trying to do is no different than what they were trying to do back in the 1960s. Keep the gold price suppressed so that the currency looks better because a rising gold price is a red flag to people around the world that something is wrong with the currency and indeed something is wrong with the currency but by keeping the gold price suppressed people aren't really necessarily spending the time to look in to see what all of the problems are you know the, the government's trying to kill the messenger in effect that's right and they manipulate it by maintaining the paper markets for gold and silver, isn't that right? Yeah, you know, there are really two types of markets when you talk about gold, and two different, entirely different things. You have physical gold, and then you have paper gold. Paper gold is just a promise that somebody's going to give you gold when you ask for it. So, you know, just like I was describing wealth in two different forms, uh, you know, the real wealth and, and financial wealth, paper gold is just a financial wealth uh, form of wealth depend on, on counterparty risk, someone's, someone's promise. So when you're buying gold, you have to ask yourself, well, why am I buying gold? Am I a professional speculator and I want to profit from fluctuations in the gold price, you know, going up or going down? You know, 1% of the population might say yes to that answer, but 99, uh, maybe 99.9% .9 should avoid, you know, speculating in gold and look at what gold's usefulness is. And that's that it's a safe haven. It's money that's outside the banking system. It's money that's preserved purchasing power over long periods of time. Um, you know, an ounce of gold still buys the same amount of crude oil it did back in 1950. Um, an ounce of gold still buys a man's suit. The story goes that an ounce of gold would buy a Roman senator his toga uh, 2,000 years ago. Um, and the reason why gold does this is that the quantity of gold it gets accumulated. It's the only thing we humans produce that does not disappear. All of the gold mined throughout history still exists. If we could envision a cube of gold, you could slide that cube of gold under the arches of the Eiffel Tower 
That's how much gold has been produced throughout history. There's more gold, there's more steel produced each day than there has gold produced throughout history as an indication of how rare uh, gold is. But basically this cube of gold grows by about one and three quarters percent per annum year after year after year, which is approximately equal to world population growth and new wealth creation. So gold is this natural form of money that preserves purchasing power over long periods of time. And if governments and central banks ignore that, they do it at their peril. And what we as individuals have to do is to ignore what governments are doing um, or avoid uh, getting caught in terms of what governments and central banks are doing with currencies and you know, be our own central bank. And the way to do that is to own physical gold and or physical silver. Yeah, and that'll really protect us against the lack of loss of purchasing power with the dollar. That's exactly right. And, and it's silver is a little bit more volatile than it is uh, than gold is, but silver basically ser serves the same function that gold does. And just as a real life example that I like to use, you know, growing up as a young boy in Ohio in the 1950s, my parents could drive the family car into the local gas station and fill it up with two silver dollars, which used to be in circulation back then at that time. Well, today, two dollars doesn't even buy you a gallon of gasoline, but if you take the silver content of those two silver dollars, you basically have enough dollar value to fill up the family car. So again, you know, gold and silver preserve purchasing power over long periods of time. It's not that gold and silver are volatile, it's that the dollar is volatile. And the best way to envision this is that Imagine standing in a rowboat looking back at the land uh, and, you know, the waves are rocking the boat and you'd swear the land was going up and down, but we obviously know that the boat's going up and down. But calculating with currencies is like standing in the boat and looking at the land. What you need to do is to stand on the land, which is gold, and look back at that rocking boat out there offshore in the water. Um, so we have to learn how to calculate prices of goods and services in terms of ounces of gold or grams of gold or, or ounces of silver in order to determine what's truly happening to the U.S. dollar. And this is true for all currencies around the world, not just the dollar. So when did you start coming up with the concept of goldmoney.com and, and was that related to what you saw happening in the future or how did that all come together? Well, it, it really goes back uh, quite some time. Um, I uh, studied international economics in school, in, in, in university, and I always wanted to, to live and travel abroad, um, and I had the opportunity to do that when I graduated from uh, college and, and joined Chase Manhattan Bank. And I was working in Thailand at the time, uh, in 1974, when a medium-sized West German bank called Herstadt Bank collapsed, and it brought the international monetary system to its knees. And what that made me do is think was, well, how can a medium-sized West German bank, you know, bring that, do so much damage to the international monetary system? How could it be so fragile? And I basically just, you know, re-educated myself on how the, the monetary system and financial system really works. And with the idea that, well, maybe I can come up with an idea uh, that would solve this problem, which I did in 1979. That's when I had my idea for gold money, but the technology didn't exist. I mean, transatlantic phone calls were uh, rare uh, and expensive if you could get a connection. I bought my first Apple II computer in September of 1979, um, so the computing power wasn't there, uh, nor the communication capability. But to me, the idea was very powerful, and I just kept thinking about it and refining it. And even though I thought in 1979 I could never do this in my lifetime, by 10 years later, the technology and everything had moved so much more quickly than what I'd envisioned 10 years earlier that I started uh, taking steps in 1992. I hired a patent attorney to start carving out some intellectual property. That patent was subsequently granted in 1997, but I actually started forming the company in 1998 and we launched in 2001. Uh, it was really just a question of technology making something possible that wasn't possible beforehand. And I think that's the key thing. You know, what we're using is a monetary system um, based on what Sir Isaac Newton created, but basically it's been abused and, and changed beyond recognition and no longer serves uh, humankind's uh, best interests because it tilts 
the, the playing field in favor of governments and government control away from the individual. And that is, has a consequence that impacts negatively on economic activity. And that's part of the reason why we're seeing such terrible economic activity these days. You know, capital is being destroyed. The savers are being destroyed uh, by zero interest rates that the Federal Reserve and other central banks are pursuing. Um, a capitalist economy is built on two fundamental building blocks, uh, savings and production. And it's the middle class uh, that really is the driver uh, in a capitalist system. Uh, and the middle class has been getting killed um, pretty much since 1971, but probably even a little bit before that, but particularly over the last several years. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, I want to stay on the subject of money of goldmoney.com because some of our listeners may not be familiar with it, but I came across it several years ago, and I'm astounded by your story that you actually conceived of it in 1979 before the technology even existed. That is just so amazing. Well, you know what? The, the reason why that is is that I'm a student of monetary history. I've got 3,000 books in my library, and I've read most of those or at least skimmed through them. And Again, going back to this point that money and currency are two different things. Money does not change. Uh, what money is today is the same as what money was 2,000 years ago. What changes is that currency evolves. It becomes more efficient. Uh, it becomes lower cost to use and therefore creates more opportunities for commerce as currency becomes more efficient. And if you look at it, you know, you started with weights of metal then they had coins, then somebody decided to put milling around the edge of the coin to prevent clipping, then you had paper money, then checking accounts, then wire transfers, then plastic cards, and then, you know, what was next? Well, that's why I came up with the idea in 1971, that eventually there was going to be technology that would enable gold to circulate as currency, putting it back to its rightful and traditional role at the center of global commerce. And what I love about gold money is you can buy gold, silver, platinum, palladium anywhere in five locations geographically around the world? Yeah, Canada, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Singapore. Um, we use uh, vaults of various different professional storage companies, uh, Brinks, Loomis, and a couple of others. Um, and the individual picks and chooses where they want to store their their gold and silver. Uh, it's all insured. Uh, we provide regular audits uh, so individuals can get the confirmation from an independent third party that uh, their gold and silver that they own is actually stored safely and securely in the vault that, uh, that they've chosen. Um, and it, the, the objective is to provide uh, our customers with assurances of integrity that their gold and silver are safe because gold and silver are are the bedrock of one's portfolio and you don't want to take risks with it and that's part of the reason why we operate and have uh, storage facilities in several different countries it enables you to diversify your holdings geographically um, and also in different uh, political uh, regimes um, because some regimes may be favorable to gold some regimes may be unfavorable to gold and we all know that in the United States, for example, in 1933, gold was confiscated uh, and wasn't made uh, legal to hold until 19, uh, uh, December 31st, 1974. Um, so, you know, people remember, you know, that gold can be confiscated, so the objective is to store it in different locations around the world. With regard to that U.S. confiscation, uh, Roosevelt only confiscated gold in the United States. Gold held by you know, citizens outside the United States was not confiscated. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen this time around if there is another confiscation, but at least you know, having gold in a different location does provide that diversification in order to mit mitigate risk. And what's so great is the, the account can be set up without requiring any funds. You wire money there. You can buy gold, silver, platinum, palladium, choose that at the daily spot price and then you can move between those if you want to through an online account and then you can sell anytime you want and have the money wired back to you so it's really taking gold silver platinum and palladium and making it very liquid um, giving you that security of having it outside the country and having your assets diversified I mean I just it's, it's a brilliant concept I just have to thank you for coming up with it it's just genius 
Well, thank, thank you very much. You know, when you, when you buy gold, when I'm talking here, of course, about physical gold, there are only two ways to store it. You store it yourself or you have someone store it for you, which is what we're doing in gold money. Now, either of those two choices, they, you know, like everything else in the world, you have pros and cons and you have to sort of figure out how things work to your best advantage. So storing it at home, you have it immediately in hand, uh, but you don't have the liquidity because you would then have to go to a coin store, store or someplace else in order to convert that uh, those coins into dollars uh, so that you could spend them. Plus, you have the risk of um, theft if you're storing it at home. Whereas if you store it with a professional storage firm, you, you uh, don't have it in hand, but you have immediate liquidity because it can be sold 24-7 and have the money wired right to your banking account, plus you have the insurance, which is very difficult to obtain if you're storing precious metals at home. So, I, again, though, for a diversification point of view, I recommend a little bit of both. You know, have a little bit of precious metals at home, maybe silver coins uh, or, you know, maybe a couple of gold coins, and then have the bulk of it stored professionally, diversified in different countries around the world. I agree, and, and that's what I recommend to my clients, too. You recently merged with BitGold. Can you tell us about BitGold, and is that your next iteration for the future and where we're going with uh, e-commerce? Yeah. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of misunderstanding as to what BitGold is or isn't. Uh, it's not Bitcoin. Uh, Bit is a generic term in IT uh, that means, means speed. And basically what BitGold is, is a digital gold currency. Now, BitGold is a Canadian company. Um, and, uh, well, let me go back a little bit. We, um, the, the, the CEO of BitGold is a chap by the name of Roy Sabag. And we met at the end of April, had a number of discussions, and quickly realized that our two companies both brought uh, strengths you know, to the table. Um, and the strengths were complementary. You know, our strengths were different from his strengths. And so we realized that it truly was a situation where, you know, one plus one equals three. Uh, putting two companies together, you come up with a total that's greater than the sum of the parts. So we announced the, um, it was announced as an acquisition of BitGold by Gold Money because uh, BitGold uh, at the time, uh, it still is as a Toronto Stock uh, Venture Exchange uh, listed uh, listed company. So, uh, what the gold money shareholders received were shares in in Bitgold Incorporated. Now, Bitgold Incorporated has subsequently changed its name from Bitgold Inc. to Gold Money Incorporated, um, but we still use the Bitgold brand to indicate the payment opportunities that one could use for digital gold currency. The, uh, let me say, though, that if you are a U.S. resident, you can open an account at BitGold and accumulate gold, but because of U.S. laws and regulations at this time, you can't actually use gold as a form of payment. So you can use either BitGold or gold money as a way of building and accumulating uh, your, your gold position. And if at some future date uh, regulations in the United States change that would enable uh, the circulation of digital gold currency, uh, then obviously that would be made available as well. So the, the, the advantage of looking at, at, at BitGold is that it's a different product in the same area than what gold money is. And I encourage people to look both at BitGold.com as well as GoldBunny.com if, if they are interested in uh, purchasing uh, gold uh, and other precious metals. Bitgold, by the way, does not have silver, platinum, or palladium. Those have to be purchased through gold money. Okay, so in effect, then, gold money takes your currency and transposes it into precious metals and then transposes it back into currency when, you, when and if you want to, whereas Bitgold is actually going to allow you to pay bills with the gold. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, I, I have um, uh, a BitGold uh, MasterCard. Uh, it's in beta, but it's going to be rolled out to you know BitGold customers. Um, I've seen the application that is being developed for uh, mobile phones. You see, you can make a, a cell phone. Uh, you can click gold from your cell phone to another cell phone. But at this time, again, not for U.S. residents, but everywhere else in the world, uh, that can that can be done. 
Um, and the, the, the key here, Linda, is basically to give gold another form of usefulness. Um, you know, m money can be spent or it can be saved. And what people tend to do is they tend to save gold because up until now there's not really been any convenient way to spend it. But gold is actually, when it's turned into a digital gold currency, a, a, an ideal form of currency for global online commerce. And that's essentially what big gold is, is, is aiming for, uh, to enable gold to circulate as currency in, uh, uh, on the internet in order to facilitate you know, global commerce. When you're using gold, you don't have counterparty risk. You don't have the delays or the costs or the payments that you incurred when you're using uh, the bank payment system or PayPal or any of the other alternatives, alternatives out there that are using national currencies for payment. So it's a much more efficient, low-cost, safer way of making payments globally. And I think um, that's going to be an important factor um, in, in the years ahead, particularly as problems with national currencies become increasingly more apparent. Wow, that blows my mind. That is so awesome. So the only thing that would concern me then is what about the volatility of gold? How do people hedge against the volatility? Yeah, it gets back to my point earlier about, you know, people think gold and silver are volatile, but it's really the, the currencies that are volatile because gold preserves purchasing power over long periods of time. So what you need to do is you really need to compare gold to the other forms of currency that are out there. Now, right now, you know, gold is down a little bit this year in dollar terms, but it's up um, 3 or 4% in terms of the euro. So it depends on you know which country you're looking at and your perspective, but over the last um, 14 years uh, since this uh, the the bull market and the precious metals started at the turn of the century, gold has been up 12 percent per annum year uh, on average uh, over those 14 years, uh, even with you know a couple of down years, and it's been basically double digit gains against all of the major currencies. So you, you, you can't look from week to week or day to day when, you, when you're evaluating whether to own gold or silver in your portfolio. You have to look over months and years uh, to see what really makes sense. And clearly when you do that, uh, you, you'll conclude that gold and silver have an important role to play in your portfolio. Not only do they preserve purchasing power, but it's money outside the banking system. And people in Cyprus learned that a couple of years ago. People in Greece are learning it more recently. And there are more people in more countries around the world that are going to learn that in the future. Exactly. And I completely agree with you that people need to have it in their portfolio. And I think, frankly, from here, probably the volatility is on the upside because we have seen that pull back and we are in a longer term trend. And I think just, you know, as you've made the point that as these paper currencies and you know the the paper um, the just the way we've been putting down the price of silver and gold through paper as well on the COMEX when that you know when people are taking physical currency and they can't just take paper anymore of course these metals are going to be the staple of what we rely on so I just again your foresight is just amazing and I think that you know I know in your book you talked about some different numbers for on the upside for gold and silver, but tell our listeners what kind of forecasting you're doing for what prices may do in the future. Okay, I'll do that, but let me just say something first because you raised an interesting point. Um, the way I look at gold is it, view it to be something that you want to accumulate over time. You know, when you in your portfolio, you have two basic groups of assets. You have investments. These are the things that you invest in in order to generate some kind of rate of return. And then you have your, your money or your liquidity. And when you're looking at your money or your liquidity, you want to preserve the wealth and the purchasing power. Um, and then you use your money and your liquidity to make an investment. So th they're entirely different things. And when you're comparing gold, you have to compare that to your other forms of, of money uh, or currency that are out there. But the way I see this is that you know just every month, just start accumulating gold. Forget about the price. Just look at gold's 5,000-year history and what it's done when uh, a country inc incurs a, a currency crisis of one sort or another. 
you know, gold is always the place to be. And so the way to, to view it is forget about the price, just dollar cost average. You know, at the end of the month, whatever you have uh, left over for your savings for that month, um, put it in gold or put it in silver and just do that month after month after month, regardless what the price is. And over time, you will be very, very happy about the amount of liquidity and purchasing power that you're preserving by doing that. It raises a second important point, uh, which I'll give, I, I think is important to get into before we start talking about where the price of gold is going, is if you have a stack of gold coins or a stack of $100 bills, neither of those are really going to generate wealth for you. In other words, you're not spending that. You need to spend that and, and make an investment to generate wealth. If the price of gold goes up, all you're doing is taking purchasing power away from the people who own the currency in which you're measuring the price of gold. Um, money only creates wealth if you invest it and generate cash flow. But you know what you're doing when you have a stack of uh, gold coins is you're basically preserving purchasing power but not creating wealth. I used the example before about uh, an ounce of gold buys the same amount of crude oil it did back in 1950. I mean, who wants an investment that didn't increase your wealth? But you do want money that preserves your purchasing power over long periods of time. So when the gold price goes up, don't you're not creating wealth in a macro sense. All you're doing is moving purchasing power out of the hands of people on the currency that you're measuring the gold price into your hands because you're the holder of gold. Uh, so. I, I think it's important to keep that in mind. You know, it's 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 not uh, it's money. It's it's not a uh, it's not a stock. Gold is not an investment. Gold uh, is a sterile asset that preserves purchasing power over long periods of time. Now, the price of gold I expect is going to go up um, for the reasons that the Federal Reserve um, and other central banks around the world are taking actions that are debasing the national currencies that they're managing. In other words, these currencies are going to continue losing purchasing power. Now, when the London gold pool broke in March of 1968, gold at that time was $35. Twelve years later, it was $850. So it rose more than 20 times in value. Um, and it, just by looking at, at history, we can say that, okay, well, you know, gold might go up a multiple of where it is today. In, in my book, The Money Bubble, um, I use three different formulas, mathematical formulas that are based on historical precedent and conclude that the fair value for gold today is about $12,000 an ounce. And eventually, you know, because markets don't like overvaluation and they don't like undervaluation, eventually fair value is going to be realized and maybe even more than fair value will be realized. Just like in 1980, when gold was $850 an ounce, it was well above its fair value at the time, um, and maybe this time it will go above its fair value as well. But you know, that's we can only wait and see. You know how the future unfolds. No one can predict the future. What we have to do when we're looking at our portfolio is accumulate undervalued assets and get rid of overvalued assets. And today, as far as the money part of a portfolio is concerned. Um, is that gold is undervalued and national currencies are overvalued. Mm -hmm. Definitely. How about mining stocks and gold miners? What about how they've just been decimated recently and it's just been shocking to see? Do you think there, we're going to see more consolidation and will that lead to fair value for them being seen in the next few years as well? Yeah. Uh, well, we're moving away from the money part of one's portfolio into the investment part of one's portfolio when we talk about mining companies. And when you talk about mining companies, you have to go through the same type of analysis that you do with any stock, which in my mind always begins with management. Um, you know, what is the quality of management? You know, and the other questions you have to ask yourself, uh, what does the balance sheet look like? Um, in the case of mines, you have the specialized knowledge of you know, what does the property look like, what does the mine look like, what are the operational um, uh, procedures taking place in the mine look like. Then you have the country risk issues because um, some countries have seized mines like Venezuela did a few years ago. Uh, or seizure can come in different ways. Uh, Australia um, recently was trying to raise the taxes on the mining industry at almost a punitive level. 
uh, and created an, an uproar there. Um, you know, so you know, mines are a visible form of wealth and often a target for cash-hungry governments. But having said that, you know, you know, are there opportunities in mining? And I think there are. Um, I'm, again, I'm a value-oriented person, and the mining shares are extremely undervalued at these levels. Obviously, there are a lot of risks still, um, and not all of the mining companies will survive. But I would tend to think if they've survived so far, the odds are that the majority of them that are in existence today are going to continue to survive uh, and probably prosper um, when we get the next uh, move up uh, in the gold price. So yeah, I think there is an opportunity there. But again, um, you know, mining shares are an investment, gold is money, two entirely different things. Mm -hmm. And the mining shares, I would think that whoever is leanest and meanest is probably going to be the survivor. I mean, that seems like an obvious assumption, but is that a, a correct one? I, I think it is, but there are other things you have to keep in mind. Is the political system where that mine is located, in the country where that mine is located, it, is it going to continue to respect the rule of law, or are some loonies going to come into the government and start seizing assets? Um, you, you've got those kinds of risks that you have to think about when you're getting involved in investments. Um, it's, you know, it, so you, you have to keep that in mind. But yes, the miners are cheap, and I do agree that the, the leanest and the meanest, the ones that have you know, come through so far, the very, very difficult environment, uh, they're the ones that are likely to prosper in the years ahead when we get the, uh, uh, the next um, bull run in, in the price of gold. And so as the price of gold goes up, then that extra, that would just go to their bottom line, right? The extra price? Yeah, it does. And you actually get leverage. You know, if at $1,100... Uh, mines costs are uh, ten fifty. They're making fifty dollars an ounce. But if the price of gold goes to uh, fifteen hundred, they're now making four hundred and fifty dollars an ounce. So you get this multiple expansion that occurs in uh, bull markets, where the mining shares themselves have a fairly high rate of appreciation compared to the price uh, rise in the price of gold itself. It's a, a leverage that the mining shares. Uh, enjoy simply because of uh, uh, the, the, the way the, the margins would operate in a rising gold price environment. Well, James, I think that's a great place for us to end on an up note. I want to thank you so much for being with me today. I want to recommend The Money Bubble, What to Do Before It Pops to, ev to all of our listeners, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well so people can purchase that on Amazon, uh, as well as The Coming Collapse of the Dollar. Is there anything else that you'd like to refer people to, to goldmoney.com perhaps? Certainly your website, check that out. And bitgold.com as well. Um, you can, as I say, Americans can open an account of bitgold. They just can't use gold as a form of currency. And they may find bitgold to be uh, uh, an, a, a useful product uh, for them. Fantastic. I love it. And I love your foresight and... I just have a feeling that, that BitGold will be allowed at some point, that the laws will change, and that, that will be the future, as you had that vision back in 1979 originally. I um, hope so. Yeah, I think so. Thank you so much for being here, James. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Linda. It's really been great speaking with you, and I hope that this information is going to be of use to your subscribers. Absolutely. Thank you. You can see now why I loved this interview with James Turk. What a wealth of knowledge, no pun intended. <laughs> he is amazing, and I so respect him. Really incredible. So more information can be found on my website at lindapjones.com, and I have links there to goldmoney.com, bitgold.com, and links to James's two books. So come on over to lindapjones.com and get some more information. Thank you so much for joining us today. Until next time, live the good life and be wealthy and smart. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.